Now, our next speaker is also from one of those places where there are not so many people, which kind of makes it really easy to focus on the work and the quality of the work. In fact, I would argue that the quality of the work has been really important for him for the last 10, 15, 20 years. And also when you, you know, grow up as a designer, as a developer, you always stumble upon books that kind of make or mark your career. Now, for me, that was you know, Andrew's books. So I'm really privileged to have him here on stage today. In fact, he's speaking a lot, and he's running lots of workshops, in-house workshops, public workshops. And so he ends up speaking a lot. And sometimes he speaks so much that he loses his voice, like today. So we hope, with a lot of you know, uh, betting and a lot of uh, medicine in place, we hope that it's going to work. If not, we have fallback. But please, you know, give a really warm, tea warm applause to Andrew Clark. And just before we start, you. maybe you could just, my little friend, good friend, pick, pick up uh, the nicest crane you find. Okay. The yeah. winner of the iPad, yeah. I believe, Ooh. from SiteGround. Big prize. All right. We have Nicole Choi. Nicole? Oh. Is she here? Oh, yes. She, well, oh, yeah, okay, excellent. Please come to us and you'll get the iPad. Okay, so like lots of really great friends. We have to do something with them. Maybe we can pull another one and we can just give away coding. Yeah. Well, lots of them. So nice. And I like smashing things around. So, <laughs> unless you want to do it, you're more in the gym than I do. I am. Here we go. We actually have a smashing challenge where we challenge each other to go to the gym every morning. He's killing it. Seriously, he's nuts. You're fitter than I am. Well, I'm running better than you do. You just lift like a small poodle. Oh, thank you. <laughs> you will never get invited again. <laughs> Rasmus Tim. All right, right, here we go. Ah! Yeah, I do throw like a... Not because yeah. I do. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe another one and then we're done. Okay, last one. Jdev. Jdev. Ooh, that's scary. I know, it's recess. Jada. 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 No. That's the iPad winner. Okay. Jada. <laughs> this box is not as deep as it looks, by the way. There's only like that much. All right, what have we got? Katie Patrick. Oh, why in? are you so far away? <laughs> <laughs> I just have to kick it. Oh, you, you can do it. No, kick, kick, kick it. I can't <laughs> it's a ball, it's a nice little ball. You need to show an Englishman how Germans play, play football. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> no way. Well, that's, that's not bad. All right. Okay, with that in mind, so the winner of the iPad, you can just feel free to just take it. It's yours. That's fine. All right. Thank you. Thanks, SiteGround, uh, for a nice uh, contest. Great. All right. So I have no idea what I'm doing here on stage now. No. It's all yours, so just go ahead and rock it. <laughs> Thank you. And the flower. Thank you. I am speechless. I have no speech. So if we get 20 minutes into this presentation, my voice fades away completely. My stunt double is going to take over. Thank you very much for that welcome. I love being back in New York. I haven't been here for a few years. Because, of course, to me, it's home to all of those classic American sitcoms that I can remember from my childhood. I can remember things like uh, Happy Days and uh, a Mork and Mindy. That was set here, right? <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> Cheers. That was another one. <laughs> Were those not the ones I was supposed to mention, literally? <laughs> Is that right? And people have called me a lot of things since I started working on the web. I tried to forget most of them. But Jeffrey Zeldman, without whom most of us wouldn't be working in this industry, he once called me a triple-talented bastard. 
And if you know how much I admire Jeffrey, you'll know how much that meant. And I work as an art director and as a designer at a small creative studio called Stuff and Nonsense. And I've been designing for the web for most of my working life, so it feels like I know this medium pretty well. And I've seen it change in ways that go far beyond what we see on screen, far beyond the emergence of those web standards technologies that Jeffrey Zeltman championed, beyond the rise of mobile and the challenges we have today with responsive web design. And at the same time, I'm watching as our industry matures into something that's very different from the almost naive creative designer's playground that it was when I started. Because it's now a place where designers rub shoulders with developers and researchers and scientists and user experience professionals. Now, much of what has changed has been for the better and our combined knowledge and experience, plus this growing maturity of the way that we approach our work, it's led in many, many ways to a better web. But as proud as I am with what we've achieved, I do look at today's web design with a growing sense of dissatisfaction. Almost a melancholy, for, for everything that we've gained, I fear that there's something that we're losing. Because while we focus our thoughts onto processes and methods and mechanics, instead of ideas, we're losing the creative soul of our work. And that's a soul that embodies individuality and personality and originality and an opinion. And it's a soul that connects people with ideas. A soul that makes those ideas memorable and it makes what we do matter. And I fear that our designs are lacking energy and spontaneity because we're thinking too early and too often about the consequences of failure. <coughs> and I fear that we're creating a web that's full of safe designs because we're driven by the need in just some of us for predictability, for reliability and repeatability. And we're creating a web where design rarely dares to stray beyond the boundaries of established convention. Now, this modern web, it demands to be responsive, and this is a creative challenge, and we should relish it. But so many of our designs follow the same responsive formulas. But I don't think that all hope is lost, and I think that we can recover our ability to be creative and to make memorable creative work for the web. Now, giving our work soul and making space and time for creativity and above all for ideas, that's the subject of this talk. And I took the title from a quote from Mad Men's Don Draper. And it's from an episode called The Monolith in season seven, set in 1968. I hope you've seen these shows, otherwise there's a few spoilers. And Don was told that this IBM 360 computer could count more stars in a day than we can in a lifetime. And he replied, but what man laid on his back counting stars and thought about a number? Now, the advertising world that Don inhabits is going to be the backdrop to this talk because I believe that advertising is one place where we can look for the soul that we're missing. And it's also where we can learn as much about clear and concise communication, reduction and simplification as we can in what many now call user experience. Now, I find advertising fascinating, but I do know that not everyone shares my enthusiasm. And as someone who studied fine art, I believe that the job of solving our biggest problems should be for artists as well as for designers or for engineers. So I'm as much a sucker for an, ad, an artist's quote as I am for advertising, but Banksy, he doesn't share my fondness for advertising, and he wrote, people are taking the piss out of you every day. They butt into your life taking a cheap shot at you and then disappear. They leer at you from tall buildings and make you feel small. They make flippant comments from buses that imply you're not sexy enough and that all the fun is happening somewhere else. They're on TV, making your girlfriend feel inadequate. They have access to the most sophisticated technology the world has ever seen, and they bully you with it. 
They are the advertisers, and they're laughing at you. And there is this common perception that advertising is an industry that routinely interrupts you when you least want interrupting. And regularly attempts to sell you products that you neither need nor want, and it lies to you while it sells. Writer and humorist Stephen Leacock once wrote, where are we, excuse me, advertising may be described as the science of arresting the human intelligence long enough to get money from it. And for some, advertising has become a dirty word. So how can advertising which is an industry which some might argue is outdated and irrelevant, teach us anything about the very different industry that we work in today. Now, in his book, Purple Cow, Seth Godin wants us to stop advertising and start innovating because as consumers, we're too busy to pay attention to advertising. Yet he acknowledges that it's probably impossible to read through a list of successful brands without either picturing one of their commercials, remembering their taglines, or hearing one of their jingles ringing in our ears. Advertising has given us some of the strongest and most memorable creative work in decades. And the mark of great advertising is that it stays with us longer after a campaign is over. Now, I guess that for every generation, they're going to remember particular advertising. For me, it's DDB's chimpanzee campaign for PG Tips Tea in the UK. The tagline, the tea you can really taste. Now this campaign began back in 1956 with a black and white commercial and a voiceover by none other than Peter Sellers. And these chimpanzees, often voiced by famous actors and comedians, they parodied popular culture and politics and sports and television for the next three decades. And in 1971, oh, is there anybody here that can remember 1971? Honestly, is it just me? Feeling very old at the moment. Avez-vous un copper? And cooey, Mr. Shifter, they became catchphrases that are as memorable as the campaign's taglines. There's no other T to beat PG and it's the tea you can really taste. Here's an ad. Oh, we might need the volume up on this one. Let me restart that for you. Ready now? Get in the hang of it, Minda Bannister's son. Oh, I can't hold me down. Don't worry, son, I shifted more pianos than you've had up dinners. Cream, cream, Mr. Shifter, like refreshment. Oh, thank you most kindly, madam. Shift in it. When a good cup of tea really counts, you're right to drink Brook Farm PG Tips. It's the tea you can really taste. Dad, do you know the piano's on my foot? You have it, son. I'll play it. I could watch that all day. Often I do watch that all day. Now, in the first two years of that chimpanzee campaign and off the back of its advertising, PG Tips went from number four to number one, and they maintained that top spot for the next 32 years, largely due to their creative advertising. But the campaign was more than just clever copywriting and well-trained chimpanzees. It succeeded because the combination of advertising and entertainment made the pleasure of watching those commercials synonymous with drinking PG Tips. Now, I could write an entire book about PG Tips and their chimpanzee advertising. Maybe one day I will. Oh man, just don't get me started on 1970s Texan bars. They were a chocolate toffee bar and the commercials featured a cartoon cowboy and possibly the best, worst cowboy tagline, a man's got to chew what a man's got to chew. They sure were a mighty chew. Today's equivalent might be Weedman Kennedy's campaign for Old Spices, the man your man can smell like. This was 
a series of commercials that cleverly targeted a male body wash product to female buyers who imagined their man smelling like the man in the commercials. Hello ladies, look at your man, now back to me, now back at your man, now back to me. Sadly, he isn't me, but if he stopped using lady scented body wash and switched to Old Spice, he could smell like he's me. Look down, back up, where are you? You're on a boat with the man your man could smell like. What's in your hand? Back at me. I have. It's an oyster with two tickets to that thing you love. Look again. The tickets are now diamonds. Anything is possible when your man smells like Old Spice and not a lady. I'm on a horse. Now, amazingly, that was all shot in one take. And the only CGI is when the bottle of Old Spice comes out through Isaiah's hand. Amazing. There are videos online that uh, show you how they made that commercial. Now, some people mis uh, confuse advertising with misleading people about a product. But successful and effective advertising through a process of reduction, of removing messages that might cloud communication, it aims to communicate and emphasize a truth about a product or a brand. DDB's famous campaign for the VW Beetle, the campaign that invented the modern advertising industry, wasn't just memorable for clever copywriting or distinctive art direction because it told the truth about Volkswagen's product. The Beetle was noisy, but it was also well-built and reliable, and that was the truth. DDB's advertising didn't hide that, and the consumers responded to it and the messages that the advertising conveyed. The Beetle was a really smart choice, and people aspired to feeling smart about choosing one. So in many ways, the ad said, this car is smart and individual, just like you. And successful advertising always provokes an emotional response in us as consumers. And as Don Draper said in the first ever episode of Mad Men, advertising is based on one thing, happiness. And do you know what happiness is? Happiness is the smell of a new car. It's freedom from fear. It's a billboard on the side of the road that screams reassurance that whatever you're doing is okay. You are okay. Old Spice is the man your man can smell like commercial, say nothing about the product itself, apart from the fact that it doesn't smell lady-scented. And they also knowingly play on the fact that the advertisers and the audience know that the product won't turn men into Isaiah Mustafa. And I'd also argue that Old Spice tells the truth about what many women consumers were thinking. They wanted their man to smell and look like Isaiah. For 30 years, PG Tips owned the truth about tea. Drinking a cup of PG Tips makes people happy. And the campaign conveyed messages about the product and it did so with the charm and personality and the wit that's so vital in making creative work memorable. So, a question. While we can all probably point to a memorable TV commercial or poster campaign or a magazine ad, can you point to as memorable a website in recent years? Now, I can think of many websites that are well presented and easy to use, maybe a triumph of user experience and technically competent, but few that are going to be remembered for years to come. Why do you think that is? Why are so few websites memorable? What might be the reasons? Could the design processes that we've come to rely on, particularly in relation to responsive design, be hindering our creativity? You know, our modern web design magazines are full of advice about process and techniques and tools, but little about creativity, about humanity, or about ideas. Can our emphasis on human-to-computer interaction mean that we're forgetting the importance of human-to-human -human communication? And does our reliance on research and testing mean that we're simply delegating design decision-making and abdicating our responsibility for designs? Has our current preoccupation with user experience methodologies mean that we're less willing to take risks? And have we 
become so fixated with designing digital products that we've forgotten that the web is a medium for communication outside of applications. You know, much of what I read today amplifies the voices of data-driven design over ideas-led design. And I believe that all of these factors have combined to create an environment that produces work that, while it's aesthetically appealing and well-considered and technically accomplished, still somehow lacks the emotional appeal that's as important as functional abilities. Now, in April last year, a list of art magazine published a letter to a junior designer by product designer at Twitter at the time, Kenneth Bowles. And in it, he made his case for young and new designers to slow down, think it through, he said, and temper their passion. Slow down, he said. You pluck an idea from the branch and throw it onto the plate before it has time to ripen. And he went on. Perhaps your teachers exalted the idea as the gem of creative work, taught you that the idea is the hard part. I disagree, he said. Ideas are not to be trusted. They need to be wrung dry, ripped apart. Now, when I read his words, and I thought about the junior designers that Kenneth was writing to, I just imagined design as it might be in some dystopian future where there's so little time for an idea to blossom before it gets crushed under the boot of user experience. When Kenneth wrote, in time the distinction between idea and iteration will blur and eventually the two will become one, I just heard the words of George Orwell. Power is in tearing human minds to pieces and putting them together again in shapes of our own choosing. So like Winston Smith's character at the end of 1984, I just imagined that the junior designers that Kenneth was writing to as disheartened and demoralised. And I felt compelled to respond, so I wrote a different letter to a junior designer, one that I hoped would inspire rather than depress those same junior designers. And I wanted to tell them that there can be a future where their energy and their enthusiasm will make a difference. That they mustn't forget that it's ideas that matter the most. Because without them, there'll be nothing. I wanted to tell them that you cannot ever turn a poor idea into a brilliant one by iterating. that instead of having fewer ideas, we must make more. Don't slow down, as Kenneth suggested. Speed up, I wrote. Your mind is a muscle, just like any other, unlike Vitaly's. You need to keep them in top condition to make, keep making ideas happen, make more of them more often. Feed your mind with inspiration wherever you can find it. Exercise it with play. Make idea after idea until making them becomes a reflex. The truth is, we don't always need to think things through, at least not right away. We can never predict the path that our ideas are going to take. And we can't know the restrictions they'll face or the limitations that are going to be put on them. So my advice is not always to try. Because too often I see brilliant ideas extinguished because people think about practicalities too early. How will this be built? How will we make this responsive? How will somebody use this? These are important questions, but at the right time. And naturally, some ideas will fade and others will dazzle. So before we pick out the flickering flame of a new idea, we should let it burn brightly for a little while longer, unhindered by practicalities. Now, this tension between data and implementation-led design and uh, ideas led web designers so starkly illustrated by our respective letters certainly is not a new phenomenon. Towards the end of the 1960s, technology had become, begun to creep into advertising. And in 68, Mad Men's Sterling Cooper and Partners Agency, they installed their first computer, that room-filling, low-humming IBM 360 that I mentioned earlier. But of course, this being Mad Men, nothing's ever as straightforward as installing a computer. Because practically, entering the future 
meant installing that on the computer on the site of the agency's creative lounge, which was a space where art directors and copywriters met to collaborate. So without a central space to share, the creatives were forced back into their separate offices, afraid that the computer would replace them. And Don Draper's only half joking when he asks the engineer who's installing that computer, who's winning? Who's replacing more humans? Now, new partner Jim Cutler's vision for SCMP is in stark contrast to Don's. And in the final episode of that season, Jim says, I know what this company should look like, computer services. This agency is too dependent on creative personalities. We need to tell our clients we're thinking about the future and not creative hijinks. Creative hijinks. Now, it might seem as, at first as if da Kenneth's data-driven digital product design and maybe my ideas-driven web design are opposite ends of a spectrum of design styles, but ideas are not at odds with user experience. They are a fundal, fundamental part of it. And the mixing of the two is a wonderful creative challenge, and that means that there's common ground that gives me hope. <laughs> Kenneth wrote in a follow-up to our letters, we'd love to believe design speaks for itself, but a large part of our job is helping others to hear its voice. And I agree, because when our work has a voice, it means it stands for something. Sir John Hegarty, he's a co-founder of advertising agency Bartle Bogle Hegarty, BBH, and in his book, Hegarty wrote, it's essential for a creative company to have a point of view, a philosophical foundation for their work. And a point of view is an essential part of design because like the best art, the best design must stand for something. And we need to ask ourselves, what does my work or my company stand for? What are our principles? And we must stand behind our work because we believe in it not because our point of view has been evolved through iteration or been validated by testing or driven by research. You know, I worry that as an industry we become so heavily focused on conversations about research-driven, data-led design and subsequent implementation issues, including performance and including responsiveness, that we need to temper our use of data with hunches and vice versa because as Kenneth also wrote, product design that's entirely driven by data is horrible. It's soul destroying for the designer. The voice is holding up. Just. Now, I'd like you to, <laughs> apart from when I say that, I'd like you to cast your mind back to advertising ideas that have stayed with you. It's going to be different in every culture. As I'm a tea drinker, and especially today, and I bet you can guess that I drink PG Tips. Now, Tips was added to the brand name in 1955 to emphasise that PG used only the freshest part of the tea plant. And it wasn't until 1956 that Peter Sellers provided the voice for that first chimpanzee commercial. Where do you think the idea for that first commercial came from? Did it come from asking a focus group? Did Brooke Bond conduct consumer research? No. The idea for the campaign that lasted three decades came when a copywriter at DDB in Spotswood, he was stuck for an idea for a new commercial. Went for a walk around Regent's Park Zoo, which is now London Zoo, and he saw chimpanzees dressed in human clothes having a tea party to entertain visitors. Now, I bet if you'd asked a group of 1950s tea drinkers to personify tea, they'd probably have suggested a beautiful Indian woman picking those tips before they told you about Ada, the chimpanzee tea lady. No market research, no listening to consumers, no work on personas could stimulate an idea of the magnitude of the PG Tips chimps. So when I imagine a website designed to sell my favourite tea, I just expect it 
to be well designed and technically proficient and easy to use. I expect to be able to find what I'm looking for quickly and the information to be well presented. When I'm buying a packet of PG tips, I expect the process to be quick and the experience to be smooth. The aspects of user experience and usability that focus on ensuring that a product or a service works well, they're important. But it's not enough. There's no magic in simply making something easy to use. Where do chimpanzees fit into the process? Now, while some of us revel in creating that's chaotic and impulsive and maybe unpredictable, others among us identify patterns and create systems because they crave predictability. And we regularly hear the word process in relation to designing for the web. Recently, our conversations about responsive design have been dominated by process. And one process that's been spoken about regularly over the last few years has been designing a page or an application's elements outside of the context of layout in some form of style guide. This is something that I wrote about back in 2012 in uh, Smashing Book 3. And separating components from layout can help everyone to focus on their design while setting no expectations for how the components are going to be arranged across responsive viewport sizes. But I worry that we're becoming so intoxicated by processes like this and we're losing sight of what we're ultimately making. One design system that's become synonymous with responsive design is Brad Frost's atomic design, and he described it as a methodology to construct web design systems. And that methodology even has its own tool it's called Pattern Lab which is used to create atomic design systems. And Brad first wrote about atomic design two years ago, and he said, lately I've become more interested in what our interfaces are comprised of and how we can construct design systems in a more methodical way. Now, Brad's inspiration for atomic design was chemistry's periodic table, and while I can't think of anything less creatively stimulating, I can imagine someone who's driven to make the creative design process predictable, finding comfort in the atomic design process. But not everyone's convinced about abstracting the design this way. Mark Bolton wrote about his concerns, and he said, conformity and efficiency have a price, and that price is design, the feeling of humanity of something that's been created from scratch. What's been described is not a design process, it's manufacturing. It's a cupcake machine churning out identical cupcakes with different icing, but they all taste the same. Squarespace, anyone? I think that it's important to remember that creativity can never be, almost by definition, should never be as predictable as manufacturing. We can't and we shouldn't attempt to rationalise creativity by turning it into a process. Because creativity is often chaotic and unpredictable. If you go for a walk, you might get an ID. Take a shower, you might get another one. They come when you least expect them. So we've got to enjoy ourselves and laugh and have fun. And as David Ogilvy wrote in his book, make it fun to work at your agency because when people aren't having any fun, they seldom produce good advertising. So get away from the computer, get away from the sketchbook, get inspiration from the world around you, go to get a different perspective every day, take a different route to work, take a bus instead of driving your car, maybe don't show up at all, maybe go to the zoo, spend the day watching chimpanzees. Now I imagine that some of you are probably wondering how if creativity is so chaotic, can it work within a disciplined business framework? And we see people answering the same question by formulating their processes into a workflow. You've probably seen this if you've worked in or bought creative services. And as the former head of design at Google and Yahoo, Irene Au defined, user research followed by interaction and product design, visual design then prototyping and developing. Formative and summative research, qualitative and quantitative data and analysis, psychology, anthropology and human to computer interaction, wireframes, prototypes, functional specifications and flowcharts. 
Where is the space in her workflow for creating work that is anything more than the visual adornment that she describes when she wrote so dismissively, they, meaning us visual designers, understand that visual adornment is meant to support the experience and not be the experience. I was responsible for material design at Google. And her assessment of creativity really shocks me. She wrote recently about whether to hire a visual designer and she said, hire a designer on a freelance basis who can create the look and feel for a site, deliver a style guide and work with your front end engineering team to build the visual assets. Is it any wonder why Irene and others have such a dismissive opinion about how designers work when we're so bloody busy promoting processes like atomic design? A process is a tried and tested method for doing something we've done before. But what is the point of following a formula? A formula will lead to a predictable but an ordinary result. And who wants to make something ordinary? Put your hand up. Go on, there you go. I know that the answer lies somewhere on a curve between chaos and process so that creativity isn't limited by parts of the process that we adopt. Now, I consider myself to be an art director as well as a designer, but one of my biggest challenges is, and facing art direction on the web, is that so few people understand what it is and how it differs from design. Now, if you ask a web designer what they think when they hear the words art direction, Many are going to mention this trend for individually designed blog or articles or entries. And now there are overlaps between creative direction and art direction and design. So it shouldn't come as much of a surprise when people use those terms interchangeably. And of course, designers can and sometimes do art direct and art directors can design. But the role of an art director is different from the role of a designer. Art directors provide the concept, and designers then provide ideas and expertise to implement that concept. And Dan Moll, he does a great job of explaining the difference between art direction and design, and he wrote, art direction is the visceral resonance of how a piece of work feels. In other words, what you feel in your gut when you look at a website, an app, or a piece of design work. Whereas he explained good design as precision. Design is the technical execution of that connection. Do the colours match? Is the line length comfortable for long periods of reading? Is the photo in focus? Does the typography hierarchy work? Is the composition balanced? When we need the skills of a designer when we create the look, but the feel requires the skills of an art director who can ensure that those messages are not lost through design. Phil Kaufman, he's an art director at digital strategy agency Springbox, and he said, design is about problem solving. Whether you're an art director or a designer, the two roles differ in that the designer is more concerned with execution, while the art director is concerned with the strategy behind that execution. And on the web, We've become so fixated with problem solving and execution that our work has lost that creative soul that I mentioned at the start of the talk. A soul that embodies individuality and personality and originality and opinion. A soul that connects people with ideas and it makes those ideas memorable. And it's a soul that makes what we do matter. As Dan Moore explained, art direction brings clarity and definition to our work. It helps our work convey a specific message to a particular group of people. Art direction combines art and design to evoke a cultural and emotional reaction. He said, without art direction, we're left with dry, sterile experiences that are easily forgotten. And much of the work that I see on the web today is exactly as Dan describes. It's dry. It's sterile. And I partly blame the lack of, the lack of art direction for this lack of soul. 
I also blame our fixation with the mechanics of user experience design. Irene Owl's list of UX skills includes only user research, interaction and product design, visual design, prototyping, web development and front-end development. Where is anything, anything approaching the role of art director in her list of UX talent? Why is art direction on the web so red? Jeffrey Zeldman, he comes from a New York advertising background. And in 2003, Zeldman wrote, on the web, art direction is rare, partly because much of the work is about guiding users rather than telegraphing concepts, but also because so few design schools teach art direction. And he went on. Whoops. Talented stylists continually enrich the world's visual vocabulary. The bad news is that we're decorating instead of communicating. Stylists, decorating. Visual adornment, just as Irene Auer described 11 years later. Now I think that art director, and Stephen, art director and designer Stephen Hay can sum up the importance of art direction for us best when he wrote, good design is pretty, but good design based on a solid concept will help make your sites more effective and memorable, especially when compared to the competition. Now many of the agencies I deal with today still favour the type of creative teams that were established in the 1950s, but the web is a significantly more complex medium to work in than that. So we need teams of people with a wide variety of skills working together. So I guess, in conclusion, much of what has changed since I began working on the web has been for the better. In many ways, we've made a better web. And I, I'm proud of what we've achieved. But in other ways, I'm very dissatisfied because for everything that we've gained, we're losing something else, and that something is soul. But I'm hopeful that not all is lost and that we can continue to make work that's memorable if we focus as much on creativity as we do on implementation, if we amplify conversations about ideas as much as we do those on process. If we create processes that promote creative ideas from the very beginning, and if we remember the importance of art direction. If we remember all of these things, if we embrace creativity over predictability, we'll give our work back what we and the work itself deserves, and that's its creative soul. I'm Andy Clark. Thank you very much for listening. More tea for you? You're not going to make me say anything else now, are you? I do, actually. Oh, now you can speak, so we can talk. Actually, my voice is better at the end than it was at the Yeah, end. it's like it's been like a little exercise for you, I guess. It's good. <sighs> so, Andrew, now I'm wondering now, uh, if we actually look into a website that we have today, it feels like many of them, as you said, are generic. You have this wonderful, nice template at the top, a photo, and then you have a grid. Then you have a few more pictures, product on the left, product on the right, text description on the right, text description on the left. Can, how can we actually break out of it? I mean, we obviously need ideas, but is there a way to, I don't know, maybe combine design patterns that we all use and love, like off-canvas pattern and you know, all those things, to create more memorable websites? I think it's more than that. I think that's, that's again, more of an implementation issue. I think we've got to remember that when we design things for the web, I and mean, people always say, you know, the, web, the web's not print. Um, you know, the web's not a poster. It's not a symphony. It's not a football team either. You know, the web is different from all of these things. But there are things that we can learn right. about, you know, fr from other media and bring those to, to what we do on the web. And I think we've got to remember that not everything that we do now is product design. You know, we hear this all the time. It's like, you know, oh, I'm working on a product. Well, because websites aren't cool enough anymore? It's like, oh, I'm a digital product designer. Well, because, you know, web designer isn't a great, you know, <laughs> great job title anymore? And we've got to remember that 
there's a, you know, there are different fields, and we don't talk enough about the creative fields. We seem at the moment to be fixated on you know, UX and, and designing products. And actually, as I, I was saying to somebody the other day, and it just kind of came to me, it's like, I don't design power tools. You know, if, you want to design a, if you want to design a power tool, that, that's great, that's, that's your job. I don't design power tools. What I design is the website that makes somebody want to buy my client's brand of power tools over their competition. Right. You know, and that's still a skill. That's, that's, still, that's still as much of a design challenge as you know, all the yeah, new I just stuff. actually really ask myself, so if I, I can't really remember, I, th I guess I can actually, a memorable website that actually stuck with me for some reason. And I guess the one I remember most over the last six months maybe or so is Bloomberg.com. Right. And the reason why is because they have such a weird um, and even annoying to some degree color scheme and also type that kind of make me wonder why the hell would they do that. And I don't know if they actually made it on purpose or not. I think there was an interview with down the designers. They wanted to be memorable. They wanted to be different across you know, all of those news websites, which basically looks the same these days. Mm. It doesn't matter. I don't think if you actually look at the grid or look at the layout, I don't think you can actually differentiate between New York Times and CNN and all the other ones. But you can definitely spot Bloomberg. Do you know any other examples that just you know, are really memorable? Um, it's, it's, it's different, I think. Um, I mean, the one that I always point to was, was done by RGA a few years ago for Grey Goose Vodka, which I thought was a really brilliant, beautiful, and creative uh, site for, for, for Grey Goose Vodka. And it was responsive, and it had all the stuff in it that you know, we do now, you know, scroll hijacking and, and all this kind of stuff. But it was so beautifully art-directed and worked so well that I think that you, know, you can find this balance. Um, and then the other thing is, I'll, you know, I should stress is that user experience and kind of ideas and marketing and advertising, they're not separate. You know, it's about giving something personality. It's not about design for design's sake. It's not you know, about designer's ego. It's about communicating and it's, a, it's about brand. And you know, one of the companies that I respect a huge amount is MailChimp. And, you know, they have a product, if you want to call well, it that. Authentic personality, voice and tone. And they have a personality, they have a voice and tone, and all this kind of stuff. And I think that, yeah, we can do it. But we, what we need to do is we need to remember that the web is more than just, A, designing digital products, and B, more than bloody Squarespace. Right. Yeah, there is a design aesthetic outside of Squarespace. Right. Please, God. Anybody here from Squarespace? <laughs> they wouldn't tell. I they wouldn't tell, is it? Yes, of course not. But uh, it, I always have a feeling that if you, we talk a lot about designing in the browser, this is kind of the way to go. <laughs> but many, many times I feel we end up with websites that look as if they were designed in the browser. Boxy, okay. um, flat, maybe fast in terms of performance. I like fast, I'm a performance guy. Uh, but is it, I, I don't think that tool is limiting in that to any degree because actually you can create pretty much everything in, in any tool. It's a tool of your choice. And it's, you know, I like limits, I like um, to have constraints, which kind of forces me to come up with an idea. I'm just wondering, is design for the browser, in the browser, actually the process that promotes this kind of creativity that you're talking about? No, I don't think so. I think that you can design boring websites in Sketch and Photoshop just as easily. Okay. <laughs> and again, it's not necessarily about the design aesthetic, it's about the strategy and the thinking right. behind it. Um, but no, I've been talking about designing in a browser since, what, 2004 or something silly. And, um, and people often think that, I mean, we had the arguments back then about, yeah, well, if, you, if you're only working immediately with what you can do in CSS, then, you know, yeah, you're going to be thinking about implementation way too early. And I think there's a certain, there's a certain truth to that. But if you find that it's useful to design something in Sketch or on a piece of paper on the back of a cigarette packet, go into Photoshop, um, you know, go into the browser, you know, switch between all of these tools. I think that's fine. Well, all we do is we, you know, we, go, we go very quickly often from a sketch in a sketchbook to something in a browser, but then often we'll go back right. and spend days working in Sketch to refine the look and the feel of it because you know, that... Sometimes there's nothing better than zooming in at 800% and just getting that little, you know, that little highlight right, or yeah, a little bit of texture in there, because you know websites can have texture; it doesn't have to be flat anymore. Um, and yeah, we do things like, for example, um, we will always we will always test 
design and test the type of typography sizes before we open Sketch, because then we kind of work into a system. But you know, if you find something's not working right, then it's you know it's okay to go back and change. So sure. I think as part of an overall process, you you know you use whatever tools you want. Right. I guess it's all a matter of storytelling and finding the right context to use storytelling as well, like finding the right strategy and figuring out a way of how to embed it into your you know whatever you do to design or build. I think that storytelling is kind of a big part of uh, what you're talking about as well. Well, I mean, I think that it's you know, okay, who, who runs a web design shop or works in a web design shop that has a portfolio online? Um, I think that quite often we, again, you know, even in the industry, we fall back on patterns where how many web designers' portfolios do you see where there's a picture of an iMac and then a laptop and then an iPad and then a phone just to show that we can do responsive design. So that's what, if you want to show how you do responsive designs, make your own website amazingly responsive. Yeah, yeah, makes that's sense. the best example. Um, so... We, quite often, you know, we're not thinking sort of imaginatively about these things, and you know, we, it's sometimes it's not whether we're selling ourselves, we're selling a product, we're selling something else. It's not the thing. What the thing is, what we do is we focus on selling something. You know, this this mug keeps a cup of tea hot for you know four hours, and it has a really nice kind of embedded French press and all these other kind of things. Um, you know, often we focus on the features of a product and exclusively, but we forget about actually, you know, what does this product say about me or the person that buys this, you know, this product? Right. And we forget too much about that. We forget about the experience that you have when you're using the product, not just the website. All right, so I guess more tea for you today. I can't drink enough tea. All right. Thank you so much, Andrew. Cheers, buddy. Thank you.